I didn't know this was timed, so I'm timing myself here too. <clears throat> Well, first of all, thank you all for being here and letting me um, come and speak with you today. I am the founder and CEO of a company named Fluorocracy, and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about it. But I wanted to start by sharing with you that seven years ago, I lived in this building here. It was in San Diego, California. And the reason that's important is because back then, seven years ago, in California, I attended One Million Cups. And my company at that point was little more than a teeny tiny dream. This was the cheapest place you could live in downtown San Diego, where my husband and I were. We had gone to San Diego with about two suitcases and $2,000 in our pocket, no jobs, in the middle of recession, and my husband had just finished law school. So it was an uphill battle from there. And um, when I went to One Million Cups, I, as I was thinking about this, what was I looking for th seven years ago? And what I wanted at the time was hope for my vision, I was looking for insights as a business owner, and I wanted answers. And I think the biggest question that I was asking myself at the time was, how do you know an idea is worth fighting for? And so I hope that as I talk today about my company and how we got to where we are today, that maybe I can share a little bit of hope, a couple insights, and if we're really lucky, a few answers, um, and thereby completing my own circle um, and giving back a little bit to what I got those, those many years ago. First of all, what my company is. We are ultimately in the online flower space. And I'm going to start by putting a little context of what the industry, a $34 billion global you know, industry in the United States alone, looks like today. If you wanted to go and buy flowers for someone somewhere else in the country, you're going to go to a site that looks like this, where you're going to scroll through a series of, of arrangements, and say you pick out this one. There is a very high chance that what arrives at your doorstep is this, which happened to a real person and sparked a rather negative conversation online because it happened to lots of other people. This unfortunately happens over and over and over and over again in this massive industry. And what's important about this and what's important about us to our company is that in every single one of these cases, there probably was a birthday or someone was trying to save their marriage or someone had passed away and it really mattered to that person or someone had gotten married or was going to get married. And when this happens, that's affecting people's lives. And we set out to try to create a different kind of experience. So I want you to imagine a little girl who is maybe your daughter or your niece or a friend's little girl. And I want you to imagine that moment when she grows up and she calls and she tells you, I'm getting married. Or I want you to think about your mother, someone who's been there through everything for you. And then suddenly you're sitting in a doctor's office and you're being told that she has Alzheimer's and she's not even going to remember her own name in a few years. And I want you to think about what happens with a lot of people at that moment. Because before people prayed, before there were empires, before there was even the written word, people were engaging in the ritual of exchanging flowers. It's that ancient. And that's to some degree why companies can get away with sending anything, because you're going to do it no matter what. Society, culture, it's just ingrained in who we are. And if you are in one of those situations where something wonderful or something difficult, or you just want to tell somebody, I love you, happens, you're in what is 60% of our market. And that, that market that we are targeting is what we call an emotional-based buyer. You're buying flowers because you are trying to express something, even if it's, if it's an expression of yourself, your own style. There is a purpose behind that purchase, and it's an emotional one. And what we wanted to do was to create something that connected in that way so that what you experienced was personal, meaningful, and memorable. 
So instead of going to a website where you see a bunch of pre-made arrangements, you instead come to a very interactive platform where you actually get to custom design the arrangement. It's built based on incredibly smart software that took seven years to build um, so that no one can make a bad choice. And this was a very early mock-up, but it gets the idea across. And um, so anyone, regardless of how experienced they are, can actually complete this. The arrangements are based on style, on meaning, on all those deep things that we use to connect. And it's packaged and delivered in a box that's designed and manufactured here in Rockford to create an entirely different kind of experience. There's a lot of cool things happening in it I can't show you yet. Our team is incredible, and I'm not talking about myself. <laughs> I'm talking about um, everyone from the person who's designed our product, who happened to be my husband, so I also think he's cool for that reason, um, to the tech and marketing teams that we're building. But before what we created today, the reason we got to where we are is because of the incredible people who came on early and believed in our company, including the former head of technology at FTD, which is the $1 billion form, like, leader in the industry, to the former chief product officer of Trunk Club, which was a $250 million dollar acquisition by Nordstrom's um, to the uh, founder of Jellyvision, which is a hugely successful company out of Chicago with clients like Disney and Caterpillar across the country. Their knowledge and insights and support is what's helped us build this product and get it to where we are today. We also have some cool Rockford people, such as Jim Keeling, who is on our board. We started our company or the, the core of what we've been doing in Chicago last year after we sort of got the technology to where we needed it to be, which is what we use as our test market. Um, we created one of the most talked about experiences in 2018 in the technology community when we did this huge installation last May for Chicago, uh, Chicago um, Innovations Celebrating Women in Tech event. We built this huge thing in downtown Chicago at their Wintrust Bank, where we gave away hundreds of mini arrangements. Women were, and men were able to create their own arrangements. And if you looked across the room that night, within every little bag was each a customized arrangement. And people were picking things because it had been the flower that they had at their wedding, or because it was their child's favorite flower. People were using flowers to tell their stories. And when we ran out within just like 40 minutes of everything that we had, and our station looked like this at the end of the night, we knew we were onto something. This included, we preceded this with an alpha test in 2015 where we filled up within a couple days, um, but this continued to validate it. I started getting asked to speak throughout Chicago. We were invited to be a part of an accelerator program. I was the, we were the first Rockford-based company to be a part of WISDOM, which is a program through 1871. So every week, I would get up at 4 and drive into Chicago to learn from some of the biggest companies in the world. And that further supported our development of our company and our product and how, and I think the biggest thing for me was learning how to be a leader. We started to get press throughout Chicago. Um, including an article we helped collaborate with in The Guardian, the London paper, which became the fourth most read paper, um, article in that section of the paper. We engaged in test sales, testing our software with customers. Um, it ended up being a sold out, or not really sold out, but a wait list only. Um, we ran out of space. These are just emails of people asking to come and test our product. Um, and then the feedback that we were getting from customers was pretty incredible. We now have moved into phase two, where we are locating our operations here in Rockford, my hometown. And we are going to be announcing our launch in a few weeks and a very exciting collaboration that we're doing in, with our launch. We are, as I said, are shipping nationally. What we're bringing here to Rockford is jobs. We see incredible value in building a consumer, a national consumer brand here because of the talent and um, the opportunity, our proximity to Chicago, but the lifestyle that we're able to offer the people who work for us. So though we are based here, we're looking at, we are, our, our, our strategy is to be shipping across the country. I want to circle back to where I was seven years ago when I was in this, living in this building 
in a single room. We shared a bathroom with the rest of the little old hotel rooms on that floor, having no money and nothing but a dream. I knew nothing about flowers. I had no background in technology. And my husband and I had kind of concluded that this idea I had was probably supposed to be put on a shelf. And I won't because we weren't ready. And, I, and, and to talk about how you get from here to having some of the biggest investors in Chicago backing your company and being ready to do a national launch with software that the former chief technology officer of the leader in the industry believes could be the future of this industry. My dream had not been in flowers. When I went to college, I wanted to go here. My, as far as I'd gotten was I wanted to go and get a PhD at Cambridge University. I went to Augustana, I worked really hard, I then went to University of St. Andrews in Scotland. I was studying peace building and international relations. And I ended up getting in, I got accepted, I was a, a finalist for the Gates Cambridge Scholarship. I didn't get the money, but I had gotten accepted to this college, King's College at Cambridge. And I worked all summer, the summer before I was supposed to go, coming up with other grants and scholarships. And I covered my three years. And then in August of 2005, Cambridge sent me a letter that said they rejected my payment plan. And the reason is because, as a foreigner, I had to pay for my entire education up front. And I lacked $90,000. And my scholarships were contingent upon my performance. So I didn't get to go. I probably could have fought it, but I gave up. My doubt kicked in. I didn't know if I was good enough. And, and I quit, effectively. I mean. They were telling me no, but so it was. Um, so I then moved to New York, and I didn't know what to do with my life. And I went into a few series of years that I found really hard. I jumped from kind of, it felt like I was jumping around. I worked in tech. I, I built this program for the YMWCA that dealt with storytelling and books, and none of it seemed to make sense. Um, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, my husband jokes that my, my resume kind of looked like this instead of like this, and that was kind of true. And can, is this fixable? Um, then, um, and I didn't understand what was happening at that point in my life until I read um, a memoir or a biography about uh, Jane Addams. And um, we know her life here in Illinois, particularly, because of the great work she did with Hull House and international work with peace building. And we obviously know, too, about how she went to you know, Rockford Seminary, what became Rockford University. But what happened in between that was a series of really difficult years where she didn't know what to do with her life. And the choices that a woman at that time was given of becoming a mother or becoming a missionary or teacher didn't fit who she was. And unfortunately, I don't have memorized the quotes from what that time in her life, which I would be putting on my screen right now. Um, but what she was saying, what she was, say, what she was writing in letters as she wandered Europe, and uh, she was sick, she was bedridden. I mean, they had these special terms, but she was suffering from depression at the time, was this weariness with her sense of self, not knowing what she was supposed to do. And when I read this, it felt very reflective of how I felt at that time. And... This time does not count on my timer, I am here to say. <laughs> so this is what she wrote, weary of myself and sick of asking, what am I and what, do I ought to, what I ought to be? That pretty much sums up how I felt. All at sea about my life. And the reason this, and, and, and Jean, Jean Beth Elstein's uh, book about her, she says that this was a necessary phase to accomplish Hull House because she had to empty herself out of self-pity, self -pity, self-conceit, and self-pride. And this is important if you're trying to be an entrepreneur or create a business or do anything because as it says in the book, Good to Great, the good to great leaders never wanted to become larger than life heroes. They never aspired to be put on a pedestal or become unreachable icons. They were seemingly ordinary people quietly producing extraordinary results. And if this is true, then that means that success means you have to be super humble and super ambitious, which are kind of, when you think about it, opposing things, right? How do you get to have that formula? And I believe is that a necessary part of that success is you have to fail at being you. Things have to fall apart. And in my case, for my story, 
this had to not happen, and I, my life had to look like this, riding the subway day in and day out, asking these questions, who am I, what do I really want to be? Which then led, when you really get down to it, what do others need? That's when the ego breaks down, right? It's when Jane Addams stopped asking about being weary about herself, and as she got to the end of this phase, when Hull House became an idea, what she wrote instead was, growing good in the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts. It's not about being history. It was about doing ordinary, hard work. And when you get past the ego and what everything looks like on Facebook, and you think about what really makes anything great happen in the world, it's really, really ordinary, hard work. And that happened for me when I was sitting in this built room. I was writing a book, and my grandmother got really sick. And my father and my aunt and my uncle sat down and thought, someone needs to go and take care of her. And the family decided that I had the least real job, and so that I should go and take care of my grandmother. And before in my life, I would have been offended by this, right? Because I had big things to do in my life. Like, I wasn't going to do that. I, like, I was writing a book. Um, but at this point, because of that chunk of years, I had stopped asking, who am I and what do I want to be? And I had started to make space for what does the world need. And what I ne the world needed right then was for me to go take care of my grandmother. And so I did. And I went and I sat on this very bed. And it was a, on this bed, I had a pile of books. I was taking care of my grandmother. She was sitting in the other room. And I was trying to be sending um, some emails to my, the person helping me make my flowers and what was going to be in my, my flowers for my wedding. And I suddenly thought, there has got to be a better way to do this. Like, do I really need 12 stacks of magazines? And should this really, there's, my, my grandmother is sick. About two weeks later, she died. And instead of thinking about, could I have taken care of her better? What did I do wrong? I had gotten to the place where instead I was watching. And we put on the top of her, of her casket this flower, it's a bird of paradise, because it had been on the plates that she'd had in her kitchen. And I watched how people responded to that. And I started to think about what the world needs. I started to think about people who experienced this. And I started to think about the fact that nearly half of all Americans report feeling alone. And that the number one regret people have in hospice is that they wish they'd been more loving to the people who loved them most. And then I started doing research. And I learned that flowers make you more likely to call a friend. That flowers lift depression in research in women and the elderly and probably beyond should the studies be done. That flowers make you heal faster if they're in your hospital room. That flowers are remembered longer than any other gift. That flowers are, are sorry. <laughs> that flowers, the only thing in testing that 100% of women responded to was what's called the Duchenne smile. And it's a smile that most adults don't give. It's a smile that you all know. It's the smile babies give to their moms. And it's the smile of pure joy. And I started to think, what can be done in a company like that? And what I concluded, just like Jane Addams, and I'm not trying to compare myself to the likes of Jane Addams, please don't misunderstand me. What I am trying to say, though, is that if you open up and let life get a little messy, which I think is a necessary part of entrepreneurship, you start to listen to other people instead of the voices of your own head. And that's when you can create an idea that has the stuff to last. And that is an idea that I believe is worth fighting for and that everyone is capable of creating if they just take the time to listen. That's what I've tried to do. We're going to launch soon. We'll find out if it works. Um, and I invite all of you to sign up for our beta test, which is going to be uh, beta, national beta, which is going to be starting soon. Um, if you love gifting flowers that are thoughtful and meaningful and tell a story to others, then you are my target market. So please sign up. Thank you. All right, let's give her a hand.